Google is planning to launch a censored version of its search engine in China. Staff at Google voice their concern over Dragonfly, a project that the company has been secretly running. Search terms about human rights, democracy, religion, and peaceful protests will be among the words blacklisted. Google told us tonight they would not comment on future plans. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories that we're covering this week. Google's search for new markets leads it to China, despite Beijing's rules on censorship. Is the company doing the right thing? CNN names names. The weapons manufacturers whose bombs are killing children in Yemen. Palestinian journalists and citizens have learned that incitement is in the eye of the beholder, the occupier. And we have another one of those videos that casts a political leader as an action hero with a little help from his friend, the stuntman. Type Google into Google's search engine, then hit the News tab. You might find a few stories that the tech giant would rather you didn't see. A few weeks back, we learned that Google was working on something called Project Dragonfly, a new search engine for the Chinese market, one that would function in compliance with Beijing's strict rules on censorship. In an organization that talks up transparency, it is ironic that only a handful of the company's 88,000 employees knew about this project. When some of them caught wind of it, they leaked the details to an online news site, The Intercept, which broke the story and put Google's top brass on the spot. Google has ventured into China before, in 2010, but back then it decided it could not live with the censorship rules there, so it pulled out. This potential re-entry into China signals a major policy U-turn involving one of the biggest tech companies on the planet and the world's largest market. Our starting point this week is Google's headquarters, Silicon Valley, USA. Times change, technology moves on, companies evolve. There was a time when Google's corporate mantra was don't be evil. That altruistic philosophy has since been amended, watered down, if you will, to do the right thing. Was that a mere shift in semantics? Or has Google made a moral adjustment in the way it does business, with China just being the latest, most newsworthy example of that? Google is celebrating its 20th birthday. In that time, we have folded it into our lives in some really deep ways. Google is by far the dominant search service on mobile devices and on computers in the world. It's very interesting when we look at how Google deals with China because that is one place where it won't be dominant and one place where it really has to pander to the demands of the government there. But I think it's something Google has to do. Google can't ignore China. To ignore China is to ignore the world. In China, increasingly nowadays, doing the right thing is, is about trading off to lesser evils. When I speak to Chinese friends, actually many of them are hopeful that they can use Google in China because they would like that to be an alternative to the near monopolist, which is Baidu. It would be a really interesting scene if there were two big search engines in China duking it out rather than one big search engine in China. Google has had a foothold in China before, operating there from 2006 to 2010, often coming into conflict with government censors. Then, after getting cyber attacked and discovering that the Gmail accounts of Chinese human rights activists had been hacked, it reevaluated its policy. A company whose stated mission is to organize the world's information effectively pulled the plug on itself in China, walking away from the world's biggest internet market. Eight years later, Google wants back in, and it knows that President Xi Jinping's government will only permit that if Google builds in search filters that meet the censorship rules, so that if anyone in China enters a term like human rights, democracy, or political opposition, Google's search engine would come up blank. So it's like a 180 degree reversal on what they said in 2010. And so it's quite a stunning turnaround that they would suddenly change because in China, nothing is, is changed. In fact, it's probably got worse in terms of the, the censorship. The laws that are in place that oversee these things have become a lot more draconian in that eight year period. So for, for Google to say it's going to go back in, it's, it's an extraordinary story. And that's why it's had a lot of attention internationally. The legitimate concern that people have that if Google goes into China that it's legitimizing uh, China's 
censorship regime that's up to people's interpretation of what a role of a corporation ought to be. Google is out to make money. And so given that there are many shareholders that want to see Google's stock price go up, clearly it's in their very right to pursue one of the largest markets in the world. This story only became public because someone inside Google wanted it that way and leaked the details of Project Dragonfly to The Intercept, an online news site. It's since been extensively reported elsewhere, but Google is not commenting publicly. It's not the first time this year the company has dealt with internal dissent on a large scale. Three months ago, thousands of employees signed a petition protesting against something called Project Maven, work that Google was doing to help the U.S. military analyze drone footage. Google later announced it would not renew its contract with the Pentagon. First Maven, now Dragonfly. Google, which deals in information, is finding that it cannot keep its own corporate secrets contained. The company has 88,000 employees, so less than 0.35% or something like that of the overall workforce actually knew about this. And once we've reported it, of course, the rest of the employees then found out. And a lot of them were very angry, not just because of the censorship issue, which is controversial on its own, but because it was kept secret from them. A huge issue inside Google is the secrecy. It's a really interesting moment in Silicon Valley because when companies like Google admit that they are pursuing controversial projects like building a search engine in China, or when uh, companies like Microsoft reveal that they've been working with the Department of Homeland Security on projects that might involve you know, the separation of families. The labor force in Silicon Valley rise up in protest and demand better behavior from their companies. So we've seen it quite vocally at Microsoft. We've heard rumblings of it at Facebook, and now we're starting to see it at Google. They should have accountability, but because they can hide behind uh, the corporate veil. There are different sets of rules and norms that are expected of corporations. If citizens are concerned about corporations becoming too powerful and becoming like nation states, then they should actually be asking the lawmakers to pass laws that require certain corporations above a certain revenue line to have a different way of responding to public inquiries. Should Google succeed in getting back into China, it stands to gain access to more than three quarters of a billion people online. But the company's competition there is way out front. In Google's eight-year absence, Baidu, a Chinese search engine, has solidified its position and now has more than 75% of that market. And old habits, even relating to relatively young technology, die hard. So even if Google manages to clear the political hurdles currently standing in its way, it will have a lot of catching up to do. Everyone at Google knows that if this is successful, it will be both politically controversial and a long, slow process to try to build back reputation in China. Web users in China have established their habits long ago, and their habits do not include Google at this point. So I, I see this as an effort to establish at least a small presence in China in the hopes that it might grow over time. Look, we have to realize that it's almost malpractice for a business that has global ambitions to ignore the largest market in the world. You can see many tech companies knocking at the door of China's huge uh, revenues, but this does not mean that China wants it. Under President Xi Jinping, internet censorship has gotten even tighter, so any kind of censorship deal that Google can strike with the government uh, now would be much worse than back in 2010. And this is the real bind that operating in China puts on such companies. How much can you criticize a government whose permission you need to operate in their market? We're discussing another story that's on our radar this week with one of our producers, Johanna Hoos. Joe, in Yemen, bombs continue to claim civilian lives. Dozens more were killed there this past Thursday. And CNN recently produced a report that was a little bit different in that it looked into a couple of angles on the bombing of Yemen that don't get much coverage. What did that report actually examine? 
CNN was reporting on that airstrike on August 9th by the Saudi-led coalition, the one that hit a school bus killing 40 children. The piece was different in two ways. First, CNN senior international correspondent Nima El Bagir reported that the bomb had been supplied by the US government as part of an arms deal with Saudi Arabia. Second, there was this graphic revealing the names of US weapons manufacturers, companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon and General Dynamics, whose arms have been used in various airstrikes in the past. That graphic went viral, and many of the tweets mentioned how rarely the media reports on the role played by the US and even the UK in selling weapons to Riyadh. The US also helps with the targeting of those weapons. I spoke with El Bagheer about the piece. We have actually consistently referred to the Saudi-led coalition as US-backed. So this isn't a new element that's come into our reporting. It was important to talk about the bomb and who made that bomb, especially because we knew that the specific technology that was used, the laser guided technology that was used in this particular strike was technology that President Obama had banned the sales of because of human rights concerns. And that, that ban was then overturned by President Trump. So. We knew that this was a really important element and it was one that it was incredibly important to get out there to our audience as they worked through how they felt about the war in Yemen. Still, it's only one piece, albeit an informative one, on a story that doesn't get nearly the news coverage that it deserves. Considering that the UN has declared Yemen the world's worst humanitarian crisis, definitely not. This war, and not just the UK and US involvement in it, has been extremely underreported. Amnesty International calls it the forgotten war. El Bagheer spoke to me about some of the factors that make reporting on Yemen so difficult. I think often what people presume to be a disinterest on the broader parts uh, of, of the media is actually, actually just an inability to get on the ground. We are trying in different ways. We are learning as we go along, as are other people in the media landscape. How are we going to report on this war that is in a, a, a place and a conflict that oftentimes people don't really have a great deal of knowledge on, but also that is incredibly difficult to get access to. And, and I think we are, we're trying our best to figure it out as we go along. And it's important to note that access to the war front in Yemen isn't just being limited by the Saudi-led forces, but also the Houthi-led government that has been very hostile to the media. Okay, thanks, Joe. Turning now to Palestinian journalists and activists and the twin inescapable realities of surveillance and censorship. Since 2015, the authorities in Israel have arrested an estimated 1,000 Palestinians for content they published or shared online. Israel even has a dedicated cybercrimes policing unit. With the cooperation of tech giants like Facebook, the state has successfully taken down hundreds of Palestinian social media accounts. And Israel's strategy in this area goes well beyond censorship. The state has developed algorithms that monitor Palestinians in anticipation of them committing a crime. Silenced and surveilled by Israel on one side, Palestinians are also having to contend with the Palestinian Authority, the PA, on the West Bank and Hamas in Gaza, neither of which is known for tolerating dissent or criticism online. In the West Bank in particular, the PA's 2017 cybercrimes law has led to the arrests of numerous Palestinians. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now from the occupied West Bank. <laughs> This past week, Ali Dar Ali became the latest Palestinian journalist to be charged with incitement. The Palestine TV correspondent is known for his live broadcasts of life under occupation. The Israeli military reportedly took issue with videos he shared of soldiers in a refugee camp near Ramallah. None of Ali's posts call for violence, but both the military prosecutor and the judge referred to the size of Ali's audience the number of followers he has and the likes he gets. And it's not just journalists. 15-year-old Tamara Abu Leban was arrested for writing the words Forgive Me on Facebook. Her alleged crime? Incitement. <laughs> Nene Mana Tamimi's crime was live-streaming her daughter's now infamous confrontation with two soldiers in her front yard. She was charged with, and then convicted of, incitement. 
just a few examples, and there are hundreds, of a charge Palestinians say has been used to criminalize criticism of the occupation. The general assumption nowadays is that all Palestinian social media users are under Israeli surveillance. They developed algorithms which monitor social media for certain keywords and later began using a profiling method known as predictive policing. Anything you say can be seen as incitement. The poet Darin Tatur was just imprisoned for saying, resist my people, resist. So the word resistance is forbidden, as are phrases like, I'm against occupation or I will resist occupation. It's all considered incitement. There are very sophisticated methods of online surveillance. With these algorithms that have been developed, the technology that is being used, it targets everyone, anyone exercising the right to free speech. What we're seeing is a violation of the presumption of innocence. People are not presumed innocent, they are presumed guilty from the start. Israel does not hesitate when it wants to silence its critics, whether Arabs or Jews, to invoke the security argument. Any criticism of Israeli policies is, from the Israeli point of view, threatening to state security. In 2016, Israel's Minister of Justice, Ayelad Shaked, boasted that Facebook complied with 95% of government requests to remove inciting content. A new Facebook bill in the works would give the government the power to make that 100%. The ministry told the Listening Post that incitement cases are examined regardless of the nationality or origin of the suspect. But there seem to be double standards at play. Shaked herself once wrote a Facebook post that appeared to justify the mass murder of Palestinians who give birth to little snakes. She was not charged with incitement. And in 2017, the NGO Hamla found that Israeli social media users wrote an inciting post against Palestinians once every 71 seconds. However, prosecutions of Israelis for incitement are extremely rare. Censorship and monitoring are not the only ways Israel controls Palestinians online. It also operates social media accounts that target Palestinians with propaganda in their own language, a practice known as the militarization or infiltration of the Palestinian cyberspace. You have pages like The Coordinator, an Israeli general who publishes information that mainly targets Palestinians and sometimes makes threats like we will enter this area in Gaza to occupy it again, or pages like Bidna Naish, we want to live, which has a photo of dollars luring people to work with them. Then there are secret accounts like that of Captain Hossam, an Israeli intelligence officer who writes to people and asks if they need help getting a work permit. In other words, they play with Palestinian emotions as well as their need for money to get them to work for them. After a summer in which Israeli snipers killed more than 150 people in Gaza, including two journalists, and were even caught celebrating some of those killings, the Israeli government announced plans for legislation that would outlaw filming Israeli soldiers for, quote, the sake of shaming them. Then there are the more traditional methods of controlling information. This month, the Israeli military arrested six journalists for incitement in a single week. At least 23 journalists are currently imprisoned, and 17 media institutions were shut down by the Israeli military last year. But navigating Israel's system of control is only part of the challenge. Too often, Palestinian journalists have come to expect the same kinds of intimidation, surveillance and monitoring at the hands of their own government in the occupied West Bank, the Palestinian Authority. Seen by many Palestinians as an enabler, an enforcer of Israel's occupation, the PA seems to have learnt a thing or two from the Israelis. The most commonly deployed charge is incitement. One doesn't want to draw a parallel, but often those who've experienced Israeli prisons have also experienced PA prisons. It's as if there's a certain type of journalist who must be denied a voice. 
The surveillance of what we write on Facebook has become so extensive, so sophisticated, that I believe we will get to the point where it will include the political and social views of journalists too. Taking the lead from countries like the United Arab Emirates, the Palestinian Authority has adopted a cyber crimes law that has had a chilling effect on free speech in the occupied West Bank. It was conceived almost overnight, with no public consultation, and then passed by presidential decree. In its first year, the law was used in a way that violates human rights and democracy. At least 30 Palestinian websites have been banned for either criticizing the Palestinian Authority or for having alliances with Hamas or Mohammed Dahlan. The law has been amended, but is still nowhere near perfect. The point is, they're using various laws in a selective way to limit opposition voices. We are seeing that it's used uh, in an abusive manner. It is not used to tackle online crime. It's used to restrict opposition and anyone addressing points that are not supported by the Palestinian Authority. So we're still calling for a repeal of that law or an amendment of it that would be in line with international standards. <laughs> Then there's Gaza, which is under the control of Hamas and where free speech is also heavily restricted. Security forces there have used harassment, interrogations and arbitrary arrests to silence online criticism. But what seems to differentiate the PA is the frequency with which it pursues journalists who are also being sought by the Israeli military. One such voice is Lema Khata, a writer with a large online following, known for her criticism of the occupation and the PA. She was arrested by Israeli forces in Hebron last month, not long after her family had been harassed by the PA. In April, I spoke to Lama Hatha. The Palestinian Preventive Security Forces had detained her husband. She told me they asked him, why don't you stop your wife from writing? Aren't you a man? And he replied, I am a man and agree with what my wife writes. Given the ever-present threat of surveillance and arrest by Israel, plus the threats coming from their own leadership, Palestinians are increasingly cautious about what they say online. A study by Palestinian NGO Meda found that 90% of journalists practice self-censorship out of fear for their own safety. For people to know that they are being surveilled all the time, whether they are aware of it or not, creates a fear on the part of the population. Fear leads to paranoia, leads to feeling that their life is totally monitored, is totally uh, uh, controlled. All of our journalistic output is monitored and analyzed. We feel as if we've somehow become like that TV program, Big Brother. Everyone is watching you. Israel is watching you. The PA is watching you. There is censorship, but Palestinian journalists can navigate this ever-narrowing margin of freedom. Because the moment the journalist goes silent, there is nothing left. And finally, the 18th Asian Games are well underway in the Indonesian capital, Jakarta. A television channel there, SCTV, produced a video to mark the opening of the Games, featuring Indonesia's president, Joko Widodo, beating a traffic jam to get to the stadium on a motorcycle, stunts included. Lame comparisons were reflexively made online to Tom Cruise in the latest Mission Impossible film, which was mission accomplished for SCTV and its action hero president. And a hashtag was born, proud to be Indonesian. Fine. Except whoever made that film should have picked a stuntman who better resembled the president in shape. Someone in the same weight class, perhaps. And given that stuntman a wedding ring to match the one that Wododo wears. That's what the continuity department's for. The little things. We'll see you next time, here at The Listening Post. Ya, biarkan saja.
welcome the President of the Republic of Indonesia, His Excellency Mr. Joko Widodo. Hadirin sekalian, mari kita sambut.